This is the IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series, brought to you by the Distinguished Visitors Program. The Distinguished Visitors Program delivers tools for individuals at all stages of their professional careers through visits to chapters, offering opportunities for individual interactions, and to the membership through webinars by respected professionals. We have distinguished visitors who cover machine learning, cybersecurity, robotics, big data, cloud computing, blockchain, and cryptography, among others. Chapters can request a distinguished visitor on computer.org slash distinguished visitors. The Computer Society pays all intercity travel, while chapters are responsible for all costs with regard to the hosting of the distinguished visitor, such as lodging, transportation, and food and incidentals in the city of the presentation. The Distinguished Visitors Program is able to pay up to $1,000 for a visit to a chapter, but by working with other nearby chapters to develop a tour, that amount can be increased. So when your chapter is planning its next event, think of the Distinguished Visitors Program. Welcome to our Distinguished Lecture webinar series. My name is Nita Patel, member of the IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Visitors Program, which provides access to distinguished visitors to more than 500 professionals and student chapters around the world. First, let's take care of a few housekeeping tasks. You can ask your questions in the Q&A panel, which you can find on your screen. Mohammed Rawadin will answer as many questions as he can following the presentation. When you are writing your questions, if it relates to a particular slide, please do your best to reference that slide. This webinar is being recorded and the slides with the recording will be made available after the webinar. Today's discussion is applications of wireless sensor networks, WSN, in the agriculture industry. Let me introduce our speaker. Mohamed Rawadin Maud Kasim has worked for 29 years in MIMOS, which is the Malaysian Institute of Microelectronic Systems, the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation Malaysia. MIMOS is the government applied and industrial R&D arm in IT and microelectronics. He joined MIMOS as a research fellow and now is the R&D manager in the technology deployment department. His research interest areas are wireless sensor networks, Internet of Things, real-time systems, and multimedia. He has participated in more than 30 national and international R&D projects as a member of the team or as a leader on the technical and management positions. Mohamed Rawadin is an IEEE senior member. He was the IEEE Computer Society Malaysia chapter chair from 2002 to 2013. As a lecturer, he has given computer science courses for undergraduate and graduate students. He has written conference papers, a book chapter on Sensors for Everyday Life by Springer Publishing 2017 and many technical reports. He is also a member of the industry advisory panel for Manash University, Malaysia and University Kuala Lumpur. Mr. Rawadin, please welcome and I'd like to pass the floor to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee, IEEE Computer Society, for giving an opportunity to me to participate in this um, DVP webinar. Uh, I also like this opportunity to thank the IEEE Computer Society R10 committee and my colleagues in MIMOS and all these Computer Society members who are participating in this uh, webinar. So the topic that I'm going to discuss this evening is application of wireless sensor network or WSN in agriculture industry. Okay. Okay, this is the contents basically I'm going to discuss this evening. Uh, even though it looks like a long list, going to take like three hours, but I'll finish it in less than an hour, okay? So basically I'll talk on the introduction and then how the IoT related to this agriculture industry and uh, the evolution of the agriculture technology from the early stage until now. 
and some of the main drivers in the agriculture technology. Then we'll move into the smart agriculture and uh, structure of uh, agriculture. And then we'll focus on the WSN node, wireless networks. There are a couple of networks that are uh, suitable to be used in the agriculture sector. Then we'll see some case studies. I'll, I'll explain uh, one of the projects that I involved personally. And of course, we'll discuss the issues and challenges. And finally, we'll uh, conclude with these conclusions. OK, IoT or Internet of Things, along with wireless sensing technologies, plays an important role in modernizing the agriculture sectors. Uh, in today's world, we can even go to the stage of unmanned agriculture with the advancement of technology such as IoT and WSN, plus robotic, and of course, with the communication technologies. The requirement has emerged due to lack of interest among people in agriculture-related activities. Most of the people uh, are moving away from their uh, village to the cities. So as such, uh, we have a lack of manpower in the village to manage their farms. Okay, And then the various communication technologies, both long and short range, such as RFID, IRDA, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth, LoRa, 4G and 5G uh, will be used uh, mostly in this agriculture sector. With such promising and high range of communication technologies, WSN <coughs> offers a good opportunities for application and improvements in the agriculture industry. Okay, this is the <coughs> Uh, what happens, <coughs> or we can say as a roadmap, from pre-internet era to IoT. So the very early stage is a pre-internet, where this is mostly human to human, where we have telephony and SMS. Then later we move on into internet of content, where we have web pages, emails, uh, information, entertainment, or in some cases they call it edutainment. Then we move on to Internet of Services. This is where we have Web2. And then Internet of People. Here we have social media, Skype, Facebook, and YouTube. And then finally, the uh, current stage is what we call Internet of Things. We are here, machines to machines, communication takes place, and some of the important activities are such as tracking, monitoring, and automation take place. So these are the roadmap from pre-internet era to the IoT era. Uh, if we see the list of applications, we can see here most of the IoT applications are uh, in manufacturing, then we go to transportation, energy and so forth, and agriculture is at the eighth place. But uh, the interesting thing is agriculture is moving very fast and I'm sure in two or three years, agriculture will be one of the top three applications in IoT. Okay. Okay, this is the evolution of agriculture technology from the manual method. Then we have the machines. Okay, then we move on to automation. And finally, now is, uh, or can say, most of the applications are based on knowledge, where AI applications such as drones, Okay, all these are applied in this knowledge era. Okay, now let's see some of the issues uh, surrounding us regarding the agriculture production. Uh, agriculture production must be increased by 70% by 2050 to fulfill the worldwide food demand. Okay, because by 2050, we expect uh, sorry, by 2030, we expect 8.5 billion human beings on this planet. So as such, there is a need to increase 70% of the food production to meet this demand. Okay, So the only way to meet this demand is through automation technology such as IoT, robotics, and many other related technologies. And then we also have a project called Internet of Food and Farm, IOF. 
2020. Uh, this uh, done by the European Commission with an investment of uh, USD 35.4 million. They started in 2017. So in other words, a lot of um, investments are put into improving this agriculture sector using this uh, latest or state-of-the-art technology. Okay, so, uh, pardon. Eh? Okay, these are the main drivers of technology in agriculture. Okay, so the first one is the automation, then the climate, then the resource optimization. So under resource optimization, you have to look into manpower, the land, the water, the chemicals. Chemicals here we can break down into a couple of things, such as the pesticides, the fertilizers. Okay, then of course, uh, finally you need uh, look into these higher yields. Okay, so these we can further break down into food crops and also cash crops. So for cash cash crops, you need to look into weathers, industry, and energy. These are basically the commodities like the palm oil and things like that. These are food crops. This uh, depends on the population, quality of food, and also urbanization. So these are some of the main drivers of technology. Okay, then we look into the uh, sequence or the progress of this agriculture from agriculture one to agriculture five. So in agriculture one, this is a, in the early 20th century, very labor intensive. And of course, the productivity solely depends on the labor. So if you have more labor, you have more productivity. But in general, the productivity is still very low. Then we move on to agriculture two, we call it green revolution. So this is um, where the introduction of uh, agronomic management takes place. Then we also have uh, agriculture three. We manage to reduce the cost, enhance the quality. Then agriculture four, this uh, goes parallel with the industry evolution. Okay, so this one uh, where we do integration of multi-level operation. And finally in agriculture five, we are moving into uh, utilizing the AI. Here, things like big data, uh, deep learning, okay, and uh, robotics, all these uh, technologies are integrated to make agriculture more productive. Okay, then move into uh, smart agriculture. So basically, what is smart agriculture is an information-based and technology-driven agriculture system designed to improve agriculture process to ensure maximum agriculture production with minimized environmental impact. So basically, the smart agriculture have a benefit of providing real-time feedback. It's a precise in both the size of the crop area it monitors as well as in the delivery amounts. WSN, or Wireless Sensor Network, is the ideal candidate to provide effective and economic viable solutions uh, WSN is a modern technology which integrates the knowledge of sensors, automation, digital network transmission, information storage, and processing. Okay, uh, WSN needs to be combined with other technologies in order to create an impact in the agriculture sector. Okay, so why IoT in smart agriculture? Okay, so IoT technique enhance the quantity and quality with reduced cost. IoT method provides improved precision irrigation techniques. It also gives a major leap with direct benefit of technology. IoT also drives the automation to next level with sophistication decision making by use of connectivity and big data. So these are some of the reasons why IoT is uh, uh, very important for smart agriculture. So let's see what the giants are doing, what I call tech giants, company like IBM, uh, Google, Intel, Cisco. Okay, So these big companies are investing a lot of uh, uh, funds to encourage or to improve the smart agriculture. They have a project called Farm 2050. And uh, this Farm 2050 is a uh, uh, collaboration of all these uh, giants. Okay. So, for example, we can see here um, Google, Google and MIT Media Lab launched an open agriculture initiative, or they call it Open AG. 
for put computer devices. Then we can see uh, like here, Dell introduced agriculture robots and machine equipped with the latest machine learning and AI capabilities. So they join with Aeropong, this is a vertical farm force, to accelerate IoT and data science services for smart agriculture. So a lot of uh, work uh, is being done by these tech giants. And uh, when these tech, tech giants are involved in such a big project, there must be something very important and must be uh, something uh, very crucial for them and also for the people. Okay, this is the basic structure and principle of uh, smart agriculture. We have these uh, few layers here. You can see these layers. These are more on the hardware or technical items. Then we have the network. Then we have this um, uh, common system platform, such as expert system, alarm management, remote control. And finally, these are the applications that you are going to use. These are some of the important parameters for agriculture. One is the soil from water and also microclimate. So uh, each of these parameters are important because uh, when we use the wireless sensors, we are going to collect data based on these parameters. And besides the individual parameters, we also need to have some knowledge, a uh, relation between these parameters. For example, the flow and the moisture, what is the relation? When the flow increase, how does it impact the moisture? So the knowledge of these two parameters will help us to optimize the resources besides increasing the productivity. So the knowledge of all these interrelation between these parameters are important. And in some cases, um, maybe like IT personnel might not have that much of knowledge. So in uh, Many cases, we need to work with these um, agriculturists, those who are in the agriculture background, who have uh, knowledge in the particular crops. So we work with them to identify what is the uh, important combination of parameters. And secondly, what are the threshold values for us to obtain the maximum uh, output from these uh, particular plants? So here we need to um, work together with the agriculturists. Then this is one example of wireless sensors we use for agriculture. So you can see these are some of the important parameters at the environment level. This is at the plant level and this is the soil level. <laughs> of course, you can use like satellite images. In some cases, you use satellite images to uh, detect certain uh, uh, features or parameters which is critical for the plants. Okay. Then you also can use like a drones, okay? Normally it has a camera. The picture from this camera will help, help us to identify, um, for example, for weeding purposes, and also to identify diseases. If your plantation is like 10 or 20 acres, it's uh, very difficult to do manually. So these drones will help us to capture the image. So based on the analysis from the image, we can identify the locations where we need to do weeding, uh, we need to you know, put uh, uh, pesticides, okay, and things like that. So this is an overview of uh, sensors we normally use in agriculture. Okay, these are the um, groups of uh, agriculture sensors. It can be a location-based sensors, can be optical sensors, can be electrochemical sensors, mechanical sensors, dielectric soil damper sensors, and also can be air flow sensors. So the details are on the next slide. Okay, so the location sensors are useful in determining the latitude and longitude. Okay, this is very important, especially when you want to spray the fertilizers and things like that. So you know exactly where's the location. Then optical sensors is make use of light to evaluate the soil properties. Then electrochemical sensors are used to collect chemical properties or information from the soil. Then you also have mechanical sensors to assess the soil compaction in the form of mechanical conflict. And dielectric soil dampness sensor, these are humidity intensity of soil by determining the dielectric constant that need to be measured. And finally, the air flow sensors, these sensors are used to compute air permeability. Okay. 
And this is a typical application of sensors in a greenhouse. So you can see uh, mostly we use the pH sensors, then the humidity and the soil sensor. This is a greenhouse. So uh, temperature, we also take the temperature in the soil level and also some cases we take the ambient temperatures. Okay, so all these uh, parameters or these data will be collected and put uh, in some cases in the local database or maybe in a cloud. Okay, and then this data will be analyzed. And then based on this data, the irrigation, the fertilizing, all this will be done. Okay. Uh, these are some of the agriculture products we can see in the markets. So uh, a lot of companies are moving into these products because there, there's uh, quite a big demand for this product. This including developing the drones, okay? And like weather or climate sensors, okay? These are some of the examples. Okay, this is a uh, WSN architecture. This is a very simple uh, basic. So you can see here it has uh, four uh, modules. Uh, one is the sensor module, okay, basically that's an AD converter. Then you have a processor module, okay, so here the controller and the memory. Finally, this uh, communication module, that's the wireless capability. And all these are supported by the power module. So for the wireless sensor, this power module is very critical. And you have to design such a way uh, the optimum power is uh, utilized uh, when this... Uh, wireless sensors are in use, okay? Okay, these are some of the networks, uh, wireless networks currently used uh, in many applications. Initially, uh, started with Zigbee, but the problem with the Zigbee is a uh, short distance. It can go like uh, 10 meters and things like that. And then we also have, uh, currently, a lot of applications are going for LoRa. LoRa is a uh, long distance. It can go like five kilometers. Okay, and then of course you have six box. The six box is um, uh, is you need to license for this. Okay, whereas for Laura you don't need to license. And then you also have like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi um, uh, it uses uh, quite a lot of power. Okay, despite the distance is short. Okay, then in some application you also use uh, GPRS. So it really depends on the kind of application that you are going to use, and uh, the choice of networks depends on it. Uh, in some cases, there might be a combination of networks. They might use Zigbee and also they might use, uh, for example, a GPRS combination. So it all depends on your application case to uh, case basis. Then this is a simple architecture for an indoor. So later I'll explain more detail about this when I go to the case study. So basically what we do here, we collect the information from these sensors so here we collect the temperature, humidity, and CO2 um, values. Then we send these through the Zigbee to the local panel or control panel. And uh, this control panel has a memory to keep this data. And then from here, we'll send through the GPRS to the cloud. And from the cloud, the users can use their mobile phone or their uh, computers or tech to access this information. And of course, to control, we use some wired system to activate the uh, fans, their misting system, and also their humidifier and so forth. Okay, so these are wired. So the um, dotted lines are all wireless. Okay. And there are a number of uh, agriculture management software. Okay, and some of these software already uh, is uh, what we call Android based. Okay, not all you need to use the computers. You can use your handphones to access or to use these uh, software. Okay, uh, this a uh, couple of software here, but the writing is small. But I'll just show a few which is uh, important. One of them is a farm at hand. You can go to this website, you can get more details. So what does this software does? Track your fields and farm activities. Manage your storage equipment and maintenance and also it allows you to assess the marketing insights and control your sales and delivery contracts. Okay, so in a way, it also helps us to do some uh, e-commerce -e or e-delivery to your customers. Okay, so you can go to the uh, uh, this Play Store and you can access some of these software. Some of them are free, you can install free. 
some the advanced version you need to pay some premium to to use this okay and uh, these are some of the applications of wsn in agriculture okay so ai applications so here we use agricultural robots okay most of these robots use the sensors for their movement for their um trackings okay and also uh, in many cases they collect information which will be very helpful to do some uh, analytics or predictive analytics okay then we also use robotics okay we use robotics um okay here you use some um, for infill monitoring you can use for crop and soil health you can check the status and these are the companies which are involved in producing some of these uh, products or applications okay then we also use the cognitive technologies in agriculture okay so basically the use of cognitive technologies help understand learn reason and interact and thus increase the efficiency so we can understand uh, the, uh, the the issues the situations for example if it's a uh, uh, disease uh, plant disease then you can use this knowledge and then you can use some uh, learning abilities to make some decisions then you also use this machine visions okay so here you can do uh, you can use field robots phenotyping okay and then grading and sorting and also use for livestock identification so here we use a lot of uh, tagging so rfids for example and these are the robots for agriculture you can see in 2010 it's a semi or full, fully autonomous. Then in 2015, you can see it's uh, mini robots. Okay, then in 2020, you can see these uh, robots are almost in every of these leaves. And finally, you can see in 2030, it is what the expected you'll have what we call nano robots. Okay, so it will help us to increase the yield and at the same time, help to improve the health of the plant. And these are some of the robots for agriculture. So these are one typical uh, uh, tractor. They have a GPS receiver, they have a GSM antenna, navigation, steering sensors. Okay, so this will help uh, for in the agriculture sector. And we also have robots for weed controller, uh, four-wheel drive weed seeking robots for so develop and task to remove weed. Okay, so intelligent uh, who uses vision system. So basically, this robot is vision system to identify the wheat, and then will uh, use these wheat maps to pull out the wheat uh, from a particular area. Okay, then we also have robots for fruit picking. Okay, so here uh, it will uh, assess all the areas of the tree being harvested. And it can distinguish between the fruit leaves by using video image, okay? And also it can uh, determine these colors eh, to detect whether the fruit is uh, ready to be picked or not, okay? Uh, of course, uh, if the fruit is hidden by leaves, an adjet can be used to blow the leaves out of there to get a clear view, okay? And finally, the pressure applied to the fruit is sufficient for the removal from the tree, but not enough to crash the fruit, okay? So each fruit, they have to... Uh, send certain amount of pressure so that only uh, the fruits will be bring down from the tree. Okay. Then the other technology is a 3D printing technology. So this is what uh, anticipated in future you will have 3D food printing. Okay, so just go to this shop and just order whatever food you want. It will just print for you. Okay, but all these are edible. Okay, so this is called a miniature food factory. Okay, so you don't need to worry about the raw material, all these things. It will look exactly like what you want. Okay, but I think this will take some time, not next year or two years time. <laughs> okay, and they also have this plant factory. So what they do is um, they convert these old containers eh, and they um, control the environment such a way that this environment will be suitable for a certain kind of plants and they also use a uh, good lighting here the led lighting so you can see there are some salads are grown here okay 
and uh, the other thing is that now the farming can be done in uh, many places okay as long you can control the environment and you have the sufficient uh, knowledge of the basically the threshold value of those parameters then you should be able to uh, plant in uh, most of the places including deserts or ex mining land saline sol soils and so forth okay Okay, this is uh, one of the applications of a drone. You can use for 3D mapping, plant counts, typography, soil temperature, soil h uh, vegetation. Okay, these are some of the applications of uh, drones. And uh, these are some of the opportunities. You get the raw image. Of course, you'll <coughs> include some algorithms. And then you can get the uh, nutrient status of this uh, particular area. Okay, so based on that, you can... Uh, fine-tune your uh, fertilizers management in the in the plant. These are some of the maps. Eh? These maps are uh, um, developed using uh, a drone, and based on this map, you can see uh, these green areas are healthy areas. These uh, yellow and red maybe need some attentions. Okay, maybe some disease, or maybe the uh, plant needs some fertilizers. And this is the case study that uh, I'm going to explain today. So basically, this case study about uh, mushroom cultivation in a greenhouse uh, indoor. So this mushroom type is what we call a shiitake mushroom. Okay, uh, this is the second uh, uh, highly demanded um, mushroom in the world. The first is a uh, this uh, button mushroom. The second one is this uh, shiitake mushroom. Okay, this is some intro about the shiitake mushroom. So mushroom are very important in human nutrition because uh, mushroom are high protein, low fat, no cholesterol, high fiber, low sodium, good quantity of vitamins and minerals. And the shiitake is the second most widely marketed mushroom in the world. So with the ever increasing demand for quality food, mushroom cultivation emerging as an important activity in different parts of the world, including in Malaysia. Okay, so in order to maximize the output, mushroom farms require day by day changes to the environment. Uh, these are some of the important parameters humidity, temperature, and carbon dioxide. Okay, these requirements can only be achieved through an automated solution and smart system using wireless sensor. Because the requirement of these uh, parameters, humidity, temperature, and carbon dioxide, uh, is different during the daytime and nighttime. So you need to make changes of uh, these. Um, uh, condition um, so that uh, you can get the best output from this uh, mushroom cultivation. So the only uh, solution that we can look ahead is this utilizing these wireless sensors. Uh, these are some of the project objectives. So we utilize wireless sensor with feedback system to optimize the climate condition, enable user to monitor temperature and humidity in a mushroom house in real time through Android-based mobile apps. Okay. So these are some of the mushrooms we grow in Malaysia. And uh, the one we are going to focus in this case study is the one in the middle. Okay, the shiitake mushroom. Eh? Okay, so this uh, mushroom, uh, in, in scientific terms, we call it lentula edodes. Okay, to have lentinan and anti-cancer compound and able to lower cholesterol levels the second most popular mushroom in the world. So we need to import, most of them are dried mushrooms. Uh, it's very difficult to get a fresh one. And this one can go up to 15 to 20 US dollar per kilo. Okay, so it's uh, one of the expensive mushrooms. Okay, so what we do, we develop a greenhouse, but since we are growing mushroom in this greenhouse, we call it a mushroom house. Okay, so the mushroom, uh, the smart system, utilizes a wireless sensor with feedback to optimize the climate condition. Okay, so this is basically the layout of the house. This is like um, 20 feet, so I would say like 7 meters, uh, 7 meters times uh, 20 meters, okay, the, the width and the... the the length, huh? 
<coughs> so we have a partition into two areas. One we call an incubation. The other one is a growth area. So this is fully dark, like a clean room. And this one, we have a netting, like 90% of the netting. So these are some of the devices we use in this uh, growth area. And these are some of the data. Okay. Uh, we, are, we will collect in these uh, two areas, the temperature, humidity, and CO2. And these are some of the uh, equipments that we are using to control the environment. Of course, we have a control room, and here is the water tank, and also we have beside it is the fertilizer. The fertilizer also in the liquid form. And of course, to, as a backup, we also have a solar panel here for power purpose. It uses the electricity, but in case uh, it's a black card or the power failures, then the solar panel will be used. Uh, this is the actual uh, project site. It's just uh, nearby to the Mount Kinabalu. It's 1,450 meters from sea level. And this is the house. And this is the incubation and this is the growth area. Uh, in the incubation, you leave it for like two weeks. Okay, after two weeks, you move to this growth area. And in incubation, you can see the mushrooms are put in a, in a late this way, horizontally. And here you put uh, uh, mushroom blocks uh, vertically because the mushroom will grow at the side of this. So that's why you cannot put uh, in the vertical, uh, in the horizontal. So it will um, overlap one and another. Okay, so you have to put in the vertical. This is a mushroom house. Okay, and uh, these are the environment requirements of the mushroom. Okay, so humidity, as I mentioned, and also the uh, temperature. Okay, so let's see what is the requirement for this mushroom. So humidity is 75 to 85, okay, in the incubation and in the growth is different, 85 to 95. In the daytime, the temperature is a bit uh, high. Then at the nighttime, you need to have uh, this level of temperature. Okay, so the temperature and the uh, requirement day and night times are different, totally different. And these are the architectures we are using, the typical three layer, physical layer, middle layer, and application layer. The physical layer, you put all the sensors or the devices. Middle layer is more for the database, the servers. And application is uh, the um, user interface for, for your end users, like uh, smartphones, uh, tabs, and also your computers. Okay, so this is the, I think I've shown this, basically collecting the sensor information from this mushroom house and then send to the control panel and then using the GPS or GSM, send to the cloud and from the cloud, the users can assess. Okay, this is how it works from the um, sensors, it goes to the control panel. From this panel, it goes to the cloud and then the users can access using their devices. Okay. And then in the physical layer, we have the wireless sensors. These are the three sensors we are using. And of course, there's some CCTV cameras. And sensor will collect the environment data. In our case, we define for every 10 minutes. And then we send to the sensor manager for storing in the mushroom database. And then at the middle layer, we have the control panel and also sensor manager. Then the smart panel will manage the monitoring of the data from the sensors, humidifier, as well as fan and circulation fan. So whenever the, the parameters reach some threshold value, and then the activators will be on. For example, the humidifier. If the humidifying is very low, then the humidifier will be on. If it's very hot, then the exhaust fan will be on. Pull out the hot S. Okay. And this is your applications. Okay, basically. The application layer consists of the UI, and in our case, all these uh, application we develop using the smartphones or Android-based phone, so that the end users, the farmers or the mushroom owners, they don't need to buy any additional devices, and it's very handy for them to use the handphones to monitor uh, at any time and at any location. These are some of the functions of this um, application layer, monitoring, Activating, alerting, and also decision making. These are some of the features allowed in the application. These are some examples of the GUI. 
so you can see the current temperature level and you also can uh, have uh, this uh, uh, graphical view you can see the graphs what happened for the past seven days okay if you want a weather report you also can get the weather reports okay then uh, this is um, you can choose which particular areas that you want is it in the growth area or in the incubation areas and of course this graph will give a more detail and actually it has some colors to indicate whether it's a low uh, within the threshold value or if it's high higher than the threshold value and if it's like a yellow color here it's actually it's below the threshold value you can see the graph for the past seven days you can see the current graph okay and also you can get details of each other point if you click on this particular point and you can get more details for example if you click this point it says the temperature here you can select the temperature it says like 23.78 okay for example and of course you also can use this kind of meters approach because some farmers or users they prefer to use this kind of meters rather than graphs or the data okay Okay, in, in this slide, we'll discuss about the results of the Smart Mushroom House project. So basically, we do a comparison between the Smart Mushroom House and also the traditional Mushroom House. So these are some uh, advantages of uh, using these uh, wireless sensors uh, and devices in the Smart Mushroom House. So basically, if you compare traditional Mushroom House uh, need <clears throat> at least four percent, whereas a smart mushroom house only need one percent. That's in terms of uh, resources. In terms of yields for three months, uh, using this uh, smart mushroom house and also the wireless sensors, we'll get around 251 grams per bag compared to this uh, traditional mushroom house, which is half of it, 125 grams. And besides these resources and yields, there are also other advantages of using the smart mushroom house. Basically, you get a faster harvest time. In other words, you get uh, more hours per year. Say, for example, if you get um, five hours in one year in a traditional mushroom, in a smart mushroom house, you will get more than that, maybe seven or eight times. And this directly will, will increase your yield uh, per hours and also throughout the year. So these are basically some of the advantages using the wireless sensors to manage and monitor the smart mushroom house. Okay, next. Here is basically some checklist for those uh, farmers or those uh, uh, audience who are interested to use wireless sensors in agriculture. So basically, you have to check your hardware. Then, of course, the security, because we are going to download or upload a lot of data from this uh, mushroom house or these uh, smart farms. Then the data collection, of course, you need to have a good database, servers, or cloud. And of course, you must have a good connectivity. Uh, sometimes this connectivity is also an issue in uh, remote areas so uh, good infrastructure the internet lines and connectivity is uh, uh, very important okay then of course the infrastructure so basically your uh, ict infrastructure internet communication technology infrastructure okay then also the mobility uh, since um, a lot of uh, applications so a lot of um, domain of applications are developed based on um, uh, mobile applications so it's good to have a good mobility here and of course you must have some good maintenance for this since we are dealing with technology electronics uh, uh, and also this uh, wireless system so there must be good maintenance and you need to get uh, some people to do maintenance and finally, the data that you are going to save is very important because in future, this data will help you to do a better forecast, okay? Because we, we use this data to further improve our farming, okay? Especially the threshold values 
what are the best threshold values to get the best output. So this this data will be very important. So ultimately, this will come one of the very important or very essential uh, part of the whole uh, wireless sensor applications. Okay, these are some of the non-technical issues and challenges. Okay, some of the non-technical issues are like standards because there are a lot of companies doing uh, tools for smart farming and um, some of these are priority, uh, proprietary standards, okay, where you might have difficult if you buy from uh, different uh, vendors, okay, selling different standards. So it's good to get some open source standards, such a way that uh, all these uh, devices that we are going to use is uh, interchangeable and also modular. Then, of course, uh, the other issue is the is awareness. Okay, in, in, in a lot of countries, the smart farming is getting attention, even from the government. So they are pushing their farmers to go into this because uh, besides getting better yield, it also will help them to uh, do the farming more efficiently and also will try to reduce the resources. Okay, then of course, it also has some high investment. Although this investment is uh, initially looks high, but in the long run, you'll uh, get a lot of uh, benefits out of this. Then, of course, uh, some farmers, maybe they are not very IT savvy, they may have this feeling of fear of new technologies. Okay, so I think things like uh, trainings, uh, hands-on trainings, you know, uh, getting them familiar with the tools and technologies will help them to get rid of this uh, fear. And of course, um, in uh, many cases, we have uh, farmers who are interested, but they are not uh, well trained. So it's good when you introduce uh, smart farming to the farmers, it's good also to give them sufficient training. Okay, so that uh, the, the, the knowledge and also the tools or devices go uh, together with the farmers. So they have the knowledge and they can use the tools or devices or the system more efficiently. Okay, these are the technical issues and challenges. Of course, you need to have a good architecture, especially if your greenhouse is in an open field. That means uh, you are exposed to a lot of um, um, weather, okay, and uh, a lot of uh, challenges, okay. And then you also have issue on the data management. So you need to have um, uh, servers, you know, to keep your data. And also your data transmissions, okay? Uh, sometimes um, you might have these issues, especially in remote areas, okay? And also the data security. And also the other thing, uh, as, as far as the wireless sensors concerned, the power management is another important issues that you need to um, uh, consider, okay? Because uh, most of the wireless sensors, they use these uh, batteries or some other uh, external source for power beside electricity. So you have to ensure this uh, power management is done properly or else you'll have problem halfway uh, because you might not, uh, I mean, the sensors might not able to support you. Okay, and these are some of the technical issues. Okay, uh, we'll uh, go each of the technical issues. Of course, the robust architecture, the first one, the wireless sensor network hardware and equipment which are directly exposed to a harsh environment uh, may destroy the equipment, especially electronic parts. Though, as such, uh, standards like IP67, especially for devices which are deployed in the open field is recommended to be used. Okay, IP67, that means if your devices got into heavy rains, it can uh, uh, take care of, of the devices. I mean, it's more like, I would call it self-managing. I mean, it can, it can stand that kind of weather, in other words, okay? Then the data transmission, communication signals from wireless sensor devices become weak when they reach the transceivers <coughs> due to many physical obstacles in the agriculture field, <clears throat> especially if you have like uh, uh, tall trees, you know, like uh, palm trees, you know, so they have uh, 
these what we call these uh, the leaves, you know, in the uh, cover very huge area. So sometimes you might have some problems with this uh, transmission signals. So as such, the most reliable and robust networking technology should be used to transfer data in agriculture environment. And then your data management, IT infrastructure for agriculture is more complicated as compared to other applications. The reason is simply because agriculture environment requires continuous real-time monitoring and support stringent environment condition. That's, that means you are going to uh, send the data, for example, every five or 10 minutes. Okay, so that means the continuity of the data is very important. And here you can use the SOA, service oriented approach, uh, as a, one of the suitable uh, software platform. Then the data security, WSN based agriculture applications, transmit millions of data every day. And the security of the data is uh, very important. Okay, the WSN device needs to make sure that sensitive data or information are encrypted before they are transmitted. There is a need also to provide a mechanism that guarantee data security throughout the wireless sensors. Then, uh, of course, the power management, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some WSN operate solely on energy scavenges from the environment through seismic, photovoltaic, and also thermal formation. Okay, so they are using some techniques to um, <clears throat> sustain this power or optimize the power, something uh, uh, like uh, power gating and dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Okay, these are some of the techniques they are using currently. Then, of course, the internet connectivity in uh, many remote areas, particularly in developing countries, strong, reliable internet connectivity is not available yet. Unless the network performance and bandwidth speeds are significantly improved, implementation of uh, smart farming will remain as an issue. Okay, so in many farmlands that have tall and dense trees, reception of communication signals become a big issue. Then the ICT knowledge, in general, majority of farmers are lack of IT, okay, especially the wireless uh, sensors knowledge. This is one of the main obstacles for deploying the WSN in rural areas. Farmers need to be educated on IT and wireless sensor system and how it can help them to run their farms more efficiently. So in other words, the training is very important for the farmers. Of course, the training should be given in, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a very, very easily understand uh, language so that uh, the layman or the farmers can understand it easy, easily. Okay. And then this is the conclusion. So basically, agriculture production must be increased by 70% by 2050 to meet world's food demand. Okay. This has been mentioned by the uh, World uh, FA, FAO Food and uh, Agri Agriculture Association or organization. Uh, we anticipate future farms are going to be small, integrated, technology-driven, and more productive. So here we'll see things like vertical farming and, and uh, uh, many other types of farming will be used. But uh, in, in summary, all this uh, farming will use a lot of uh, wireless sensors, in other words. You can see in countries like uh, in the U.S. and Japan, uh, they are having farms uh, in in, uh, in 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 their office. Okay, some part of the office is allocated like a greenhouse. They have this uh, vertical farming. Okay, so basically they control this uh, environment or environment uh, smart agriculture. Okay, then we also have uh, these uh, technologies. Of course, these technologies. Uh, should uh, go uh, together. For example, the wireless sensors with robotics, drone, vision, big data, community, all these are some of the enablers for the agriculture industry. So the combination or tuning of all these technologies will uh, improve the agriculture industry in general. Then uh, the issues that we have highlighted, the seven issues that we have highlighted in the earlier slides uh, need to be improved in order to enhance the wireless sensors application in agriculture. And uh, hopefully we'll meet the world uh, food demand by 2050. Okay, so that's the last slide in my presentation.
So I open up for any questions from the audience. Thank you very much for your time to listen to this presentation. Thank you once again.